Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer at The Washington Post, and welcome to Washington Post Live. The National Gallery of Art here in Washington is at the center of a controversy. At first, the pandemic caused the delay of a highly anticipated retrospective of work by modern artist Philip Gustin that would contain stark, subversive images, drawings, and paintings evoking the Ku Klux Klan, among his other works. But after much consideration, the director of the National Gallery and the directors of three other museums set to put on the exhibition decided to postpone the show for the foreseeable future. Because of this controversy, because this controversy is more than meets the eye, I am happy to welcome to Washington Post Live, Kaywin Feldman, the director of the National Gallery of Art. Welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, so um, talk us through talk us through this decision. Um, right now, it seems like there's the, the public controversy is centered around censorship and shutting down of an exhibition, and that there's a lot of uh, a lot of harumphing and and umbrage being taken. Um, that's the public conversation, but it strikes me that there's a lot a whole lot more going on here. Absolutely, and, and thank you for having me today and for, for asking those questions. I, I would like to start with a couple of disclaimers, and um, mm -hmm. one being that the four museums um, have worked collaboratively on the show all along, and um, we all heard from our staff members um, individually about concerns about going forward um, at this particular moment. And so the four directors came together and we made the decision together. But what I have to stress is that the situations for each of the four museums are all very different. We're in different cities, um, London, Houston, and Boston. And um, our museums are on different journeys um, in the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and access world. And so um, I speak only for the National Gallery, not for the other three museums. And um, the other disclaimer I wanted to make is that um, obviously I am a white woman of privilege and um, in having the discussion about the, this exhibition, uh, you know, it, it, we have to talk about race. And um, I, I wanna just be clear that I in no way think that I speak for um, African-Americans, that I've spent a lot of time listening to um, friends, colleagues, staff members, and I have internalized what I've heard, but I don't speak for um, an African-American audience. And I also recognize that an African-American audience is not singular, that there are as many opinions across the spectrum as there are in any um, audience. So with those sort of disclaimers, um, I'll also start by saying um, that I am the luckiest person in the world because I work at a remarkable institution with a terrific staff and we do profoundly meaningful work. I always like to say that art has been important since people started painting in caves when we first became human, and it is just as important today. And how lucky we are that we actually get to work um, with artists, to show artists and do work that people find so meaningful and important um, as we see with this um, issue around Philip Guston. Okay, so um, in, in in your second disclaimer, there was a, there, oh, actually in both of them, there was a lot there that I want to get I, I want to get to. the The fact that you were hearing from folks on staff about their concerns about uh, the exhibition, who were you hearing from, and what exactly were you being told? So I was hearing from staff across the institution. So um, we uh, had a large uh, committee of staff helping us to think about the interpretation and programming of the exhibition. Um, uh, we have the most terrific security guards here at the National Gallery of Art. As you can imagine, um, having been closed for most of the last uh, six months, I've come in every day and I spend my days um, talking to, uh, spending a lot of time talking to our security guards. And um, I have to stress that they are professionals and they are experts. They are experts in health and safety and security. They are also experts in the general public. And they know much more about our public, about public reactions and understanding than I do sitting in my office up here. 
and 85% um, of our security guards are also African-American. And so um, I, I um, listened to them. I also spent a lot of time um, talking to colleagues um, across the field. Uh, I often say that my only qualification for doing diversity work um, here at the museum is that I'm highly curious and that I'm humble. And so my job is to listen and learn. So, so Kaywin, then, when you're talking to the security guards, would you say 85% of the security guards there are African American and that they are experts in the general public? What what were they telling you about their concerns about the show? Concerns about the um, imagery, and so maybe this is a good point, if you don't mind, for me to step back and talk a little bit about the artist and the work, and just to give some context. Sure. Is that Okay, yeah, sure. I want to be sure people know what we're talking about here. Um, and I have to start off by saying that um, justifiably, Philip Guston is considered one of the most important American artists of the 20th century. And I think he's an artist of great skill who managed to combine works that are both sometimes personal, sometimes highly political. He sometimes used figurative art. He was sometimes um, used abstractions. Um, his works are sometimes funny and um, other times highly disturbing. And it's that combination is part of what makes him such an important artist. And uh, Gustin, who um, was Jewish and born in um, Canada, moved to the United States uh, early with his family and um, became an artist. And in the 30s, he was working for the um, WPA, the Works Progress Administration, and started doing um, figurative murals. And even at that time, started um, he was highly disturbed by the Ku Klux Klan and started exploring um, the imagery. And then went on um, to uh, eventually end up in New York and became a part of the really the heart of the New York abstract expressionist movement. Uh, and it achieved great um, success and was, uh, was quite widely even recognized at that time for um, his importance um, and his uh, role in the New York art world. But it was by about the late 60s that Gustin became disturbed by the world around him. He was um, uh, disturbed by um, police violence, by um, politics, by war, um, by discrimination, and uh, no longer felt like abstraction was the way for him to um, really express his um, outrage and his curiosity about um, what led humanity um, to an often um, dark position. And so he, his, his work sort of um, changed again in the, um, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, he started to, to use uh, figurative um, images, uh, symbols, and motifs very often in his work. And this is where we see him return to um, these hooded figures, which were, of course, an analogy or a symbol of the, of the clan. And um, he would um, use these images as a kind of stand-in for evil. And he even said what, at one time he was doing them because he wanted to understand what it felt like to be evil. Um, he also at one point noted that, it, that he was the person behind these hoods. And so um, for him, he really was using them as a way to explore um, the hurt and pain and disappointment he saw in the world. And the way he did it was by creating these sort of almost um, clownish um, figures of these of these hoods and um, almost cartoon like. And we see them riding around in cars. They're smoking um, there. There's you know, one sitting in a chair by a window with a standard um, you know, domestic um, house lamp next to him. Uh, we also see a hooded figure um, painting. So, uh, you know, what. Um, of course, is a, uh, an analogy to a self-portrait or the, the, you know, the artist. And so people quite rightly argue that Gustin is the artist for this moment because he did engage with really challenging times. And there could be a time more challenging, I think, than what we're all going through today. And right. so Gustin really, he, he was appropriate for the moment. And so I'm finally getting to um, the answer to your question, which is, um, the, the challenge for museums, and this is not a story about Gustin, actually, it's about museums, is that he um, appropriated 
images of black trauma by using these clan hood figures. And um, I argue that the use of imagery from genocide is different. It's not just upsetting. It, it goes to another level. And whether it is genocide against um, Native Americans, a Nazi imagery, clan imagery, um, that there's a pain there that puts that art in a different category, which doesn't mean it can't be shown, but it has to be shown with tremendous care and concern and empathy for the viewer. So a, f a few things. One, um, uh, I'm glad, Kaywin, that you described you know, some of Gustin's work because we've made the decision at Washington Post not to show the images um, also to your point of perpetuating uh, some of the trauma. Um, two, I'm, I'm, as I was listening to you speak, remind me, this show was put together and nailed down five years ago, right? So a different, a, a different America at that point, right? Yes, so we began it um, five years ago. And I, I think your point's an important one because not only are we in a different America than we were five years ago, of course, we're a different America from when Gustin painted those right. images. Um, we're in a different America since um, March 13th. You know, it, it, the time has changed and art, of course, changes with time. It doesn't stand immobile. Right, and, and we're a different America. Uh, um, especially since May 25th, when um, the, the, the killing of George Floyd in, in Minneapolis. Um, I, I bring up all of that because in response to this controversy, I, the National Gallery, you just hired your first diversity chief. Um, when you came in, you've only been the director of the, of the museum since March of 19, 2019, right? That's correct. So, so you come in, so you've inherited, you've inherited this and you inherited uh, an all white executive team. Um, and I guess the question I'm getting to is, is part of the problem here that there weren't any people of color, particularly anyone black on staff at the front end who could, who could who could have been a part of the process to at least start running the traps on what could be pitfalls in a particular in a particular exhibition, this one in particular? Yes, that's right. Um, and I, I do want to point out that we are changing our staff, and I'm very proud that our executive team is now thirty percent um, people of color. So we are um, moving in the right direction. But you're right that um, we. Uh, should have started this work much earlier. And, um, you know, I have received a lot of criticism through this, and um, I absolutely understand it. And um, I quite frankly welcome the discussion. I think it's really healthy for our field. I think I'm being criticized actually for the wrong thing, though. And um, as, as you point out, what we did wrong was we didn't start this work soon enough. And we should have even realized five years ago that um, we had a different America. And where I hold myself accountable was about a year ago. So I had been here for a few months. Uh, I was in a planning meeting about the exhibition and looking at an installation plan. And I looked down and I turned to the team and I said, well, wait a minute. What are we going to do about the Klan pictures? How, how are we going to handle this? And um, I was told that we would write you know, some text explaining the artist's intention and that, you know, these images have been around for a long time and they hang on museum walls and so people are used to them. And I remember it vividly because I stopped on it. I just thought, no, and um, I should have paused the project at that moment mm. to really think it through and make sure we, we got it right. And I, I waited too long to do that. So I absolutely hold myself accountable um, for that. Well, you know, there, I, I'm going to ask a, a, a controversial question here because a lot of the I've done a lot of reading about this and a lot of the controversy has been about, oh, well, in addition to folks in the art world and academia and art critics 
who were leveling criticism against uh, against you and the other institutions for for putting a, a stop to the show temporarily. But it also has this notion of um, protecting protecting the black community from trauma. Whereas for me, in this time that we're in, my mind goes to, well, wait a minute, what about those folks who might go to the, to the museum and see the Gustin images, not read the context, but see it as a, as a, a work that they find solidarity with? Um, how does an institution I was going to say guard against, but how does how does an how does an institution deal with folks who come in come through its doors and take the wrong message from from what the point of the exhibition, but also the point of the artist? It's a very good point, and um, I can't tell you how often in our field um, we talk about how to. Um, you know, the goal is to have as many people as possible come and see what we do, uh, whether it's an exhibition or the permanent collection, to stop, to really, really look. And I have to stress that that is the most important thing, to really look. Um, we hope they'll also read. And we hope that we spark um, such curiosity that they will um, go home, that they'll read, they'll go on the internet, that they'll order our fabulous catalog, which is um, selling like hotcakes um, and available, that there are lots of ways that people will um, move along a path of lifelong learning. But of course, what we can't do is control what their response is. And, um, you know, a lot of people through this discussion about Gustin have said very emphatically, you must tell people what to think. If you explain the artist's intentions, it's all going to be fine. So it's on you to explain the artist's intentions. And of course, that's true. We stand behind our scholarship, our research, and our belief in, in the artist. And we also understand that people come with their own background, ideas, expertise, experience. And uh, I'm a great advocate for having empathy for the viewer. And I think it's also respect for our audiences, that we respect they come with their own thoughts and opinions. And you and I were talking um, a moment ago about our security guards. As you can imagine, very often when people are um, surprised, delighted, upset, angry at art that they see, the first person they speak to is a security guard about their experience. And so it is so important for us at the gallery to be able to work with our guards, to um, talk about the artist's intentions, to talk about their feelings and understanding, to get their thoughts on how we might help our viewers and visitors um, in seeing the work. And um, that, that that listening has to be such an important part of it. And, and one of the reasons that we paused at this moment, um, we didn't want to use COVID as an excuse, but COVID is absolutely a part of it because right now, we can't even gather our space and our, I'm sorry, our, gather our staff in a single space. Our security guards used to meet every day in the auditorium and it was a time where um, I could go see them all and, and chat with them. Right now, we can't even have that many people in a space. They are spread everywhere in the building. So each conversation is a one-on-one. -on -one. And um, as you know from your, your work, it's really hard to have difficult, engaging conversations about things as um, profound and sacred as identity and race by Zoom. It, it, <laughs> well, you need yeah. to have those conversations in person. Right, right. They need to be, they, those kinds of conversations need to happen in person. So you know what I want to do? Um, I want to just sort of to pull the lens back, actually go back three years to another controversy that is very similar to this one now, but I do think that the that what happened at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the lines are actually more clear. And it was a and it was a work um, called Scaffold, um, and it was a work by um, an artist named Sam Sam Durant, Durant, right? Yeah. Sa Sam Durant, and it, it was supposed to be this this big 
open air scaffold of seven different, I think it was seven different instances of public executions throughout American, uh, throughout American history. Huge controversy uh, blew up in, in Minneapolis because one of the genocides uh, or one of the, the public executions uh, being depicted was of um, a, I think it was a genocide of 30 something Dakota, uh, Dakota Native Americans, um, something that is seared into the memories of, of the Dakota people, one, that was one. Two, the land upon which this this the sculpture garden and where that sculpture that that scaffold was supposed to appear was was Dakota land, and so part of the reasons why one of, one of the reasons why I asked that question earlier about people taking the opposite message from seeing Gustin is something that the um, artist said in uh, the Los Angeles Times a Q, did a Q and A with him. And talking about the controversy um, and the perspective that he gained from talking with folks, and he 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 said a protest developed, and then there was a backlash to the protest. There were people driving by the protests and screaming racist things at the protesters, saying things like, "Quote, that's our trophy. Don't you touch that!" and throwing rocks at them, throwing rocks at the protesters. Can you talk about? the the uh, that moment that scaffold moment in, at the Walker Art Center and how that um, informs you now given the controversy over Gustin. Yes, I thank you. I think that is a good um, uh, analogy. And I was actually living in Minneapolis uh, during that time period, and the director at the time, um, Olga Viso. Um, was and remains a very close friend. And I have to say she has been um, a wonderful source of support and advice for me as I have um, progressed through this um, decision. And um, it is a case where when um, Olga and the Walker team saw the, um, the work scaffold originally installed at uh, an art show, uh, Documenta in Germany, uh, they along with the rest of the art world uh, found the work really um, uh, upsetting and also very impactful and felt that it was a really strong statement about capital punishment. And so, um, you know, like Gustin, with all good intentions, they decided it was a work that um, belonged in the sculpture garden and that should be um, something discussed and, and debated um, in um, Minnesota. But um, you know, they will be the first ones to recognize that they waited too long to actually then talk to the community and, and, and understand what the, what the community had to say. Um, and what Olga and Sam both talk about is hearing the pain expressed by the community. And um, interestingly, I've also had um, a long conversation with Adam Weinberg of the Whitney to get his advice. He used the same conversation about causing people pain. And um, you know, to my earlier point, I do think that we call some art difficult, but when something is harmful to people, it has to be considered with greater sensitivity, greater care, and um, more empathy. And so they, they talked about causing pain. And um, Olga in particular re related to me a story of hearing from the Native American elders that um, you know, suicide, is, um, suicide rates are especially high among the, the Native American youth in our nation. And the elders said to her, you are um, sending a hurtful message to our youth about your lack of respect for the, or the, uh, the value of their lives. And, and of course, that was not anything that Olga uh, or anybody at the Walker or the artist would ever have intended. But you don't learn those things unless you actually listen to people. And um, that's, so you're right, this is absolutely a lesson for us because I, we just need some more time to listen. And, um, and of course, this time, this moment is so fraught. Um, people are all exhausted 
and um, you know under great stress and um, uh, there's so much uncertainty and ambiguity ambiguity in our world right now and mm -hmm. so we just want to have some time to have these conversations well I mean it's one thing to to listen which is you know I agree uh, folks should be listening but I do th the, the lesson I also take from what from what you're saying is that there needs to be a proactive move on the part of the institution and the artist proactively to go to the community and talk to the community about what they're doing. You know, that same artist, Sam Durant, the, uh, Durant told the LA Times how, he was asked, how has this changed your work? And he, you know, again, about social justice and reckoning with our nation's racial history. And he wrote, I don't feel that I can't take up any subject that I want to. The question is, how do I do it? What information and what images do I use? Maybe there are some I don't use. And then to this point, he talks about how he's you know, working on something related to Confederate monuments and memorials, and he's already proactively going to the Southern Poverty Law Center and the NAACP. Um, so we, I cannot believe that we are almost out of time, Kaylin, because I have two, two um, questions that I want to ask you. One, last, I, last reporting I saw was that the exhibition was put off until 2024. Is there a, has that timetable been moved up at all? Yeah, we're actually, um, the four museums have been talking about schedules and dates, and um, we're hoping that we've found a solution where um, the exhibition might open in 2022. So we're still confirming um, details, but that's the plan. Um, and then the last question, and I should have asked this, I should have asked this earlier when we were talking about the staffing at the museum, but, you know, among the the, the critics that, that have been out there, there's this one... Um, this one group, um, a bunch of employees, past and present, of the National Gallery who've dubbed them, um, they say, uh, well, it's this open letter. Um, it's dismantled the NGA, and the opening line is, we write to ask the National Gallery of Art how it can exist, continued, uh, contented to be known by its own employees as the, quote, last plantation on the National Mall. Can I get your reaction to that moniker on the museum and what you are doing to change that? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, it, the, we did receive that um, anonymous petition um, over the summer. And um, immediately after the petition, um, we, uh, announced a couple of town halls. In fact, um, our trustee Darren Walker is doing a town hall with our staff um, next week. Uh, we hired our first director, uh, our uh, chief of diversity, um, inclusion, and belonging, who's already started. We are recruiting right now for a curator with in the contemporary art department with expertise in African American and African diasporic art. Uh, I've diversified our leadership team, and um, you know we're not showing Philip Gustin without spending a lot of time hearing from our staff and our security guards. I um, I, I I'd like to, to sort of pivot from your comment to say that um, after the killings of uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, museums across America issued statements of you know, solidarity with our African-American communities and a commitment to change. And now um, social media is filled with questions of, okay, museums, what have you done? And um, uh, I would, uh, maybe the last thing I'll say is that one of the best articles I saw about the Gustin moment is by a junior at Cornell who um, wrote about museums and museum culpability. And she said, she wrote, after endless outcry and petitions for museums to take actionable change, now it's actually being attempted and resisted by the same voices that demanded it. What would immediately reinstalling this show offer? What would that imply for how we hold museums accountable for the change we have demanded? That, I, I, I... You're going to have to send me that uh, that uh, column or that paper from the Cornell student because it sort of scratches at the surface of the deeper conversation that I that I was um, 
that we can't get into because we've run, we've run out of time. But I do think, and one of the reasons why I was so anxious and glad you accepted the invitation to talk about this is because it seems to me that the Gustin controversy on the surface um, is one thing, but it's about something bigger and about something, something more. And it's more than just works on a wall in an institution. It is about the institution or those institutions and the people in it and the, and the, the decisions that they are making with all good intentions, but making them without any input from the surrounding community. So with that, Kaywin Feldman, Director of the National Gallery of Art, I can't thank you enough for, for being here today. Thank you for having me. I hope that you'll have me back so you can find out and hold me accountable. Absolutely. I'm going to take, I will absolutely take you up on that. Kaywin, thank you again. Thank you. And as always, thank you for joining us tomorrow. Tune in for the next event in Washington Post Live's Voting Matters series featuring, featuring former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick and members of the band Portugal the Man. As always, you can head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register for upcoming events. And as always, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post, and you've been watching Washington Post Live.